So, a little Shakespearean theme this year, to slot or not to slot. Uh, so, to slot is to expose a block to an immediate direct shot with the objective of making a key point on the board. Hopefully everyone knows that. We have to explain this. It's going to be a long morning. However, um, in an hour, you're not, I'm not going to be able to pass on rules, formulae, and the complete answer is to slot and when not to slot. Um, if you could all do that, then backgammon would have been sold years ago and you wouldn't be here this morning. So what we're going to do is basically cover some ideas, the way you should think. Uh, obviously, we're going to look at a load of positions as we go through the morning. Uh, try to point out the salient features of the position, how you should think about it, and come to a conclusion. But one of the things you learn about backgammon is that a very small difference in the position can make a large difference to the answer, which is why people make lots of mistakes in backgammon. And again, Zoe asked me upstairs, can you ever play the perfect game of backgammon? Well, even the best players in the world over a 15-move game will probably make a small mistake in there. Um, over a 45-move game, they will certainly make a number of what we call an error rather than a blunder. The difference between a good player, a really good player, and just a good player is that they tend not to make many blunders, so they tend to think in the right way most of the time. And part of this really is about trying to help you think better more of the time and to try and get your thinking as clear as possible when you're over the board. And again, lots of people, uh, I've prepared this so I know the answers so I can look really good. Um, and probably Adam yesterday as well, same sort of thing. If you're an analyst and you spend a lot of time, and I, I spend a lot of time analysing and, and working out how snowy works and how extreme backgammon, which is, by the way, extremely good, and at $50, an absolute bargain if you don't have it on your machine. Uh, that was the advertising spiel finished. Uh, but learning how to analyse is very important, and then when you've learned to analyse, you then need to take that into the game, and that's the tricky bit, because under the time pressure that you face, I mean, I've played an awful lot online this year, and sometimes 30 seconds is just not long enough, right? So you are going to make mistakes. So if you accept the fact you're going to make a mistake and you're not going to get all of these right, then you'll lead a much more comfortable and happy life than if you beat yourself up every time you make a mistake. So end of the philosophy, <laughs> right? General principles. So to go back to basics, right? Why would you slot a point? Um, to make a point that would be difficult to make naturally, i.e. there are not you haven't got many men or checkers in the area, and therefore you need to be more aggressive and to use efficiently the checkers that you do have. In the opening, it's partly about unstacking heavy points. You start with two men on the 13 point and the 6 point. That's incredibly inefficient, so it seems logical to make use of them, even if you take some risk. Again, to utilise sparse resources effectively, it's a little bit of duplication on the first one, if we're going to be honest. And lastly, quite often, and we'll come to examples of this, backgammon is a game of huge uncertainty, right? So in a game where you've got 30 moves to go, um, there's going to be a lot of possibilities for swings of outrageous fortune. See the quiz I've just handed out. Uh, so if you can reduce a backgammon game to a one-roll proposition where you are a 25 to 11 favourite, quite often that's the right thing to do. So... Um, Let's move on. When McGreal wrote Backgammon back in the 1970s, he put out his basic principles for how you play Backgammon. And those principles have not changed, right? McGreal was a genius because he was way ahead of his time in understanding what was going on on the Backgammon board. He didn't have any computers. He just had himself and his colleagues at MIT, like Roberti and co., doing a lot of thinking. And they all came into backgammon from chess because they were bored with chess and the theory was more or less developed. In backgammon, they saw the opportunity to uh, do something new and to create some of the theory that we're all playing by today. But those tenets, those principles by which you play backgammon, really haven't changed that much over time. All that's happened is they've been refined. Right? And again, so he has tactical principles and strategic principles. And, you know, critically, if you have five men back, it doesn't matter if you have a sixth man back. If you have zero men back, then getting one man sent back 
is probably significantly detrimental to your game. So, you know, if you're ahead, uh, and we'll come on to the next bit. So, McGreal did his bit, and then over time, people came up with other ideas for fundamental principles for playing backgammon, and summarised in one slide, right? These are the other four tenets by which you should probably play the game, right? So put your checkers where you want them, right? Time and time again, you see people putting checkers out of play on the ace point, and okay, sometimes it's right tactically. But as soon as you've got men buried, yeah, armies fight better when there's a whole army. Um, so if you're fighting 15 men with 13 men, you're at a disadvantage. And the more checkers that are out of play, the less chance you have of actually being the winner at the end of the day. When in doubt, hit. We've all seen that one. Right? So if you've got a choice between two plays, you can't make up your mind, just hit. Right? It's right more often than you think. Another fundamental point, prime an anchor, attack a block. If your opponent has two men back, the way or probably the best way to win is to prime that anchor so that you can't escape. A single blot is very different. Single blots have a habit of squirming out and disappearing into the uh, distance, so quite often the correct tactic is, is to attack. And when ahead in the race, race. Now you might think that's fundamentally quite obvious, but that principle didn't emerge until around 1980, as we'll see when I show you some examples from the 1970s in a minute. Okay. So, those four things allied to McGreal's principles, if you followed those things and did nothing else, you'd begin to be a very good player, right? So I've now split this into three. So the opening, middle game, and the end game. We'll look at examples from each. OK, opening roll. I'd like to play 2-1, 4-1, 5-1. I don't know whether you did this yesterday or not. Only 2-1. Only 2-1. All right. So, and the answer was? <laughs> Slot, all right? Um, but actually, yeah, yes, it's technically correct to slot, the computers will tell you. But a large part about this is lifestyle choice as well, all right? So if you're not comfortable with very complex games, then by all means, play 24 to 23, splitting the back checkers, if that leads to the type of game that you're comfortable with, yeah? Because the equity difference is quite small. 4-1. Who slots with 4-1? There's still a few left. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's probably not technically correct, right? but it, it's not that bad that you should worry about it. Yeah? And certainly in um, match score situations, it's quite often correct to slot. 5-1? Flat will slots with 4-1 all the time. Sorry? Flat will slots with There you go, you see. Yeah. But, I like, I like the slot with 4-1 because it puts immense pressure on your opponent if it's not, if neither of the blocks are hit. 5-1? Uh, Who slots with 5-1? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, OK. Right. But it is, it's really all about a lifestyle choice. And sometimes I'll actually play 24-18 to 18 with 5-1 just to mix things up a bit. I, um, yeah, I, I don't do it very often nowadays. But um, one of the things about the opening roll you think about it, which I did this minor calculation like last night, there are about 630 sequences of opening rolls. So if you look at the 15 opening rolls, how they could be played, and the 21 dice rolls in response, and look at the practical opening moves, there are about, you need to know about 600 opening sequences, which is why people don't do modern chess openings or the equivalent in backgammon, right? Because there are too many and we've only got to move two. But all of you should know at least what you think you should be doing in response to each of the opening rolls with any of the rolls you can do. So spend an evening, a damp winter evening, just writing them out one, one day and see where you get to.